Welcome you all in our uh, Corona Cures webinar series. I am Vijay Soni from Cypreneur and uh, Corona Cures. So in today's session, uh, we are actually going to discuss that uh, uh, why and how we can redefine the uh, COVID-19 from a viral to an, to an inflammatory disease. So viral diseases have always been there and uh, in case of COVID-19, the increasing rate of deaths uh, is something that is bothering us. So the question is, is it actually due to the excessive viral load or impaired immune response? Is there any other point of view? So therefore, in order to address these questions, we invited Dr. Soman Basak. Welcome, Dr. Soman. He is yeah, an, a senior staff scientist at National Institute of Immunology, NII, New Delhi. His lab, that is a senior, uh, the, that is a system immunology lab, is basically working towards the understanding the regulatory role of NF kappa B signaling in immunity and human ailments towards the development of novel therapeutic intervention strategies. He is also the recipient of the two highest Indian biological award that is Shanti Sharup Bhatnagar Prize, SSB in 2019 and National Bioscience Award for Career Development in 2017. So in today's talk, Dr. Vasak is going to talk that uh, COVID-19, is, is it a viral or an inflammatory disease? He is, he is going to tell us that the so interplay of immune cells and, uh, and cytokine in the, in the response to the SARS-CoV-2 infection and its clinical manifestation as inflammatory ailment and how we can target inflammation as a treatment option for COVID-19. Before we start the webinar, I would like to request our audiences to post your questions in the chat box and please keep your question as, as short as you can. We will try to answer them at the end of the session. Now I would like to request Dr. Basak to start the session. Hey Vijay, thank you very much uh, for putting this together. You guys are doing a remarkable job. Thank you, sir. A uh, lot of webinars going on around, and uh, as you can imagine, that uh, it's uh, this association uh, for NIA alumni, and I really felt uh, a lot of excitement out there. So really, I get a chance to reconnect and have some conversation going on uh, inflammation and immunology. Honestly, we are from National Institute of Immunology. And I'm sure that the audience is a bit more heterogeneous than in alumni alone. And what I would do though, here to have an overall conversation uh, with certain immunological and biological aspects of this COVID-19. And I would try to push forward an agenda here that is quite abundantly clear on the title of the talk. COVID-19, a viral disease or an inflammatory ailment. So uh, let's go into the talk and we will have conversations at the end. And uh, again, it's an exciting opportunity for all of us uh, to reconnect and talk about immunology, not only about cure though. And it will be very evident in this talk that you need to understand immunology for developing cure for any disease for that matter. And this is the first slide. And as you can see, I'm giving a historic perspective. So this is Ramesh V, Pharaoh of Egypt. And uh, we're talking about uh, 1100 uh, BC. And uh, when those mummies were uh, discovered and then examination was done, you begin to, they began to see those small lesions. They were very, uh, very, very clear that this could be smallpox lesions. And uh, even uh, in those pyramids, you see those sculptures where oftentimes you will see some human being with one leg that is definitely thinner than the other. And these have been discovered. Uh, and a little bit of uh, examination, people became uh, clear that this could be nothing but poliomyelitis. The point I'm trying to uh, bring home is that these diseases, they were known to us. Uh, we have been living with viral diseases. They, we didn't know about the causative agent though. Later, uh, in last 100 years, I will uh, talk about it. Uh, we came to know that many of these diseases are caused by viruses. But we are living with viral diseases, pandemic diseases, for thousands of years. And as you can see, the first human virus, 
was discovered uh, not even you know it's just 100 years ago virus human virus that was discovered is not you know it's merely 100 years ago that was uh, in the context of yellow fever and uh, eventually the discovery of the virus and the realization that the virus is uh, you know vector bone that helped a uh, great deal to finish panama canal and then we identified the causative agents as smallpox and polio so the point here is that we began to know that there are these things called virus and uh, they infect human and they cause a lot of human diseases uh, and it's 100 years of uh, history and first coronavirus was the one that was discovered as an avian infectious bronchitis virus 1937 less than 100 years ago and in 1961 again it's uh, 50 years of a little more than 50 years a strain b814 was discovered and this strain was discovered by uh, British Medical Research Council. And it was discovered from a boy who was suffering from common cold, but he didn't have sore throat. So they got a bit curious. They couldn't, uh, they could isolate something from that uh, sample. They could not culture them the way other uh, flu virus could be cultured at the time. They had to get to into an organoid culture. Uh, and, and then from there, they could decide, they, they could isolate a strain. They then named it B814. And uh, when uh, this strain was you know, inoculated in a healthy human being, they developed similar symptoms. So that's the first human coronavirus. Unfortunately, that strain is lost now. But eventually began to know that there are a lot of coronaviruses and electron micrograms began to show that they have this kind of spike, which uh, helped us to tell them, uh, name them as coronavirus, uh, as a virus genome. Uh, and uh, genera, and uh, now we see there are a couple of coronavirus species that are all around, uh, around seven, honestly. Uh, not all of them are so uh, deadly, uh, but there is this Mars coronavirus and there is this SARS coronavirus. These two we have heard about in recent time, in last two decades. And then we are actually uh, uh, very much uh, disturbed with this new one that is called SARS coronavirus 2. So this is the SARS coronavirus 2. This is an electron microgram image, again, showing those spherical uh, viral particles. And then you have this nucleate, uh, nucleate material in viral genome inside it. And, uh, and then again, this corona, right? I mean, this uh, name that uh, shows the spike proteins coming out of the virus. We're not going to really discuss too much about the virus per se, but we'll see the immunology of the virus. Uh, induced immunological uh, changes that we'll discuss today. But this is the virus, SARS coronavirus 2. And why are we discussing this? That's an important, that's a very important question. That's a very important take home message here today. Uh, as I said, that we've been living with viruses for a while. We had this polio virus, we had these uh, uh, pox viruses, we had these coronaviruses also. We've been living with them for 50 years. We know that we have discovered these are coronaviruses, we've been living with them for 50 years. We're discussing here today is because of these numbers that we have, these are all in thousands, 1837,000 people infected in Asia. This percentage of total population is written in parentheses, it's nearly 0.03%. But in Europe, this is 0.3%. In North America, it's 0.7% of the population is infected. In South America, right now, it's 0.4%. These numbers are coming on 20th of June. And we do not see any indication that this is going to cease to exist in coming months. It's an abated pandemic and it's infecting people all over, the, all across the world. And, uh, and, and, and that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's causing panic in the people, in, in, in the population. But when you look into the case fatality rate, that is the number of cases in registered as COVID and how many has been, and this coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 2, causes a disease that we are naming COVID-19. So if you look into the case fatality rate that people that has been uh, registered as COVID-19 patients and how many of them have died, this is a percentage of infected. If you look into those numbers, we are getting around 2.6% in Asia, 8.1% in Europe, 5.7% in North America and South America, we have around 7.5%. Africa it has already mounted up to 4.9%. Fortunately, North America and Europe, its numbers, this case fatality rate is dropping a little slowly, but it is dropping down. And the numbers that are coming from those hospitals, that they, you need around 10 to 15 percent of the people that needs to be hospitalized. And around 5 percent, that's the global case fatality rate. 
So I'm going to really turn it around. I'm going to really ask you a question. So what is this that we should be worried about with this disease? We can clearly see that most of the infected individuals, around 85%, are recovering without the need of any significant medical intervention. That's again, you know, the other way of looking at the problem from more of an optimistic view that 85% of the people are getting infected with the virus and they are just like any other virus that we get infected day in and day out. They're getting well soon. They are showing very mild or moderate symptoms and without any serious medical intervention, they are going to, live, uh, going to go forward to live with their healthy life in another two to three weeks. And in uh, other words, then one would be worried about the other 10 to 15 percent people who are going through a serious disease symptom. We call them severe patients, severe COVID-19 patients. And this is where the problem lies. We are going to take you through these couple of more slides to discuss this problem that why some people are showing such severe symptoms. First, let's discuss what is this severe COVID-19 symptom. But the symptom starts around five to seven days and it is associated with the severe COVID-19 is associated with respiratory distress, dyspnea. So you have a blood oxygen, oxygen saturation that's falling down 93% below. You will begin to see lung infiltration of liquids and cells. You will see damage to alveolar epithelial cells and you will begin to show signatures of septic shock. One needs to be careful I'm not going to say that COVID-19 is a sepsis-like disease, but there are signatures that matches up on what you see in septic shock. And then you begin to see respiratory failure, of course, multi-organ dysfunctions, and there are some comorbidities that has been discussed. Uh, so this is what is all about this severe COVID. So that's the, that's the symptom that you have 85% of the people were recovering on their own without any serious medical intervention. Another 15% they are showing severe respiratory distress accompanied by low oxygen saturation and multi-organ failure. So now question is, if you want to really think about addressing this disease, I argue here that we should be thinking about this 15% people who are suffering from severe COVID, but the 85% of people, you do not care much. It's because we are getting infected with one of the other virus every other day. And we should then thereby focus on this 15% people who are showing severe symptoms and try to understand what is causing them and try to understand what sort of interventions one may have. And then this is what it is that, uh, you know, again, as you see, this is a respiratory virus causing respiratory distress and respiratory virus and their infections are typically self, self limiting and they're confined to our airways uh, because of immune reactions that restricts their spread and they typically evoke mild symptoms you must have heard several of those respiratory viruses influenza for example rsv and let's look into the immune reactions that you know it's uh, again uh, this couple of slides we are basically talking about things that we already know uh, with regard with respect to immune reactions to respiratory viruses it's nothing new to us. And let's quickly refresh our memory on what do we know about immune reactions to respiratory viruses. And this is, in this, in this slide, you can see this lung areas. Typically, you know, in a steady state, you have all those uh, immune cells, particularly you will focus on these green stuffs. These are alveolar macrophages and then are some uh, respiratory dendritic cells. They are in this lung epithelia. And then there is this uh, draining lymph nodes, uh, lung draining lymph nodes. That's the steady state. Within three to six days of infection, this local epithelial cells will start. Once they encounter virus, these are this black uh, material, uh, spots, these are viruses. They will secrete inflammatory chemokines and cytokines. And at this time, in the draining lymph node, you see accumulation of dendritic cells from lung, they will drain to the local lymph node and they will interact with the T cells to start educating them. And by seven to 10 days, you will see this what accumulation of these affected T cells at the site of infection. And you will begin to see 
the onset of hemorrhagic immunity that is directed by b cells so that's more or less what you see in respect to cells and when you look into the pathways this is what you will see and these are remember this slide is bit uh, busy but not all these uh, molecules pathways and things are working together so when you have a cytopathic virus for example i feel that covid uh, uh, corona viruses do show cytopathic effects these viruses and they infect epithelial cells here it infect uh, any viruses are cytopathic viruses that are infecting lung these cause epithelial cell damage uh, and uh, necrosis so that releases also danger associated molecular pattern so viruses and danger associated molecular pattern they will actually activate local cells including epithelial cells macrophages and dendritic cells particularly dendritic cells will produce a lot of interference that job of this interference to protect local cells from further virus infection and this is completely fundamental immunology i'm trying to refresh our mind on what we know and this local macrophages and epithelial cells will also produce quite a bit of cytokines il1 beta il6 these are the inflammatory cytokines and this will drag these neutrophils and these neutrophils are granular and they produce perforin they produce uh, granular uh, cationic uh, lipids the uh, inflammatory lipids cationic proteins and they produce reactive oxygen species and that's how they would like to uh, destroy virus at the site of recruitment but neutrophils also on their own produces a lot of uh, neutrophils also on their own produce a lot of cytokines such as il1 beta mmps and they thereby exacerbate inflammation and another thing is going to happen during these first few days genetic cells will go to local lymph node and there they will produce uh, educate t cells and you will have th1 and th17 cells these are very important these cells have an important role to play uh, and they will produce cytotoxic t lymphocytes that is cd8 ctls and then there are uh, reports of cd4 ctls this cells will the cytotoxic t lymphocytes come to the site of infection there they produce a lot of perforin granzymes and these cells are begin these molecules are very important to destroy infected cells and thereby that limits viral propagation so initially it is interference that will limit viral propagation and subsequently we have this influx of neutrophils and then cytotoxic lymphocytes they will produce molecules which are very non specific in nature but they will kill local virus and virus infected cell but these molecules are also not so good for us it's going to really damage tissue if it is unchecked and this is where you have a regulatory t cell component that comes in into the picture and that sort of trims this inflammation by producing il10 this is an anti inflammatory cytokine and that restricts overt activations of these t cells and thereby that restricts inflammation so what we get here is this simple diagram there's a lot of discussions we had had that you have virus infection and then if if this is a very nice diagram if you have too much inflammation is going to really cause tissue damage is going to really remove virus but it's going to really cause tissue damage but if you have too little inflammation that's okay that's not going to really damage your tissue but that will allow allow virus to continue to perpetuate in the infected tissue and that will eventually lead to systemic uh, failure with this particular this really respond to virus we have local cells phages epithelial cells are activated and they will bring neutrophils and then dendritic cells will educate t cells cd8 t cells particularly they will kill these infected cells when they are recruited at the site of infection many of these cells including cd4 t cells neutrophils and macrophages will continue to produce cytokines that are important for recruitment of specialized t cells and then subsequently b cells will come into picture and they will have antibodies so that's all known question is why some people are dying because of sars coronavirus infections how about our immune system if it is known about this how you know a respiratory rna viruses work and we have an immune system which is balanced after that you have il10 which will clean the inflammation restore homeostasis by uh, removing virus and then restore homeostasis by limiting inflammation if these are all known why some people are dying in sars coronavirus infection how about our immune system or is it that something special about sars coronavirus that uh, interferes with our immune system so let's look into this picture and next 5 or 10 slides very quickly 
this is one of those long and I have done as much as possible, very careful, uh, uh, you know, uh, literature survey. One problem with this is that uh, you see that that literature, right, scientific literature continues to evolve. It takes some time. It goes through self-correction mechanism. Many reports uh, begin to, I mean, we can see the clear contradictions. Uh, but I try to be, you know, I try to balance it uh, as much as I could. We'll see. This is one biopsy, actually. It's very few biopsy results are available. Clearly show that there is mononuclear inflammatory integrates in the lying biopsies. And this is one example where they have used epithelial, bronchial epithelial cells. They infected them with such coronavirus. They infected them with influenza virus or they treated them with inter interferon beta and they did a RNA seq analysis. And this is what you see here is a principal component uh, analysis to really know how responses, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, were similar or very different. And clearly you see the SARS coronavirus. This is a very distinctly different response as compared to influenza virus or even typical interferon beta response that you can see in epithelial cells. The, the, the underlying mechanism is not yet clear, but clearly the whole uh, uh, epithelial response is kind of a bit skewed. Or one can say that every virus do their own response anyway, right? I mean, one should have been comparing this with SARS coronavirus, uh, SARS virus, not the not the IAV. But accompanied by this was this, uh, you know, uh, systemic an analysis of uh, C-reactive protein. And now from here on, we will not compare. Uh, will not compare. Uh, for uh, COVID patients and healthy patients. We'll try to compare severe COVID and mild COVID to understand why this 15% are dying. Because I know if I can cure them, then it's another virus I can live my happy life. So you begin to see that there is a huge increase in C-reactive protein in the patient's cell. Those people who have died, those people who had very serious disease as compared to those who were discharged. And this was accompanied by an increased level of IL-6. It makes sense. Uh, typically, the macrophages that I talked about that are present in the lung and they react to pathogens, they produce IL-6 as well. And this IL-6 goes to uh, liver and they, uh, they provoke liver cells to make C-reactive protein, which is going to really now activate complements. Typically, in virus infection, interferon alpha try to suppress C-reactive protein function. But this data suggested that interferon, again, this interferon pathway seems to be a bit skewed. Otherwise, you would not have such a huge C-reactive protein accumulation in severe COVID patients. And this is, of course, accompanied by an IL-6 increase indicative of inflammation. A more thorough study was done later. And this is 13 ICU patients and 28 non-ICU patients. And they were compared with healthy control which is less of an important. But they measured a bunch of cytokines, TNF alpha, IL-1, beta, MIF-1 alpha, and a lot of good reports, a lot of good data came out from this study. Clearly, you have people with severe COVID, that's ICU care people. Those individuals have a heightened level of TNF alpha, heightened level of MIF-1 alpha. They measured a few others, but things didn't match up very well. Interestingly, in this paper, they show that IL-6 levels are not very different between ICU care and non-ICU care. Again, it's again suggesting that there is still inherent contradiction in the literature. But together, it makes the point that there has been a substantially increased expression of cytokines in COVID-19, particularly in severe COVID-19. And where these cytokines are coming from? So another paper that came up uh, in, during those early days of COVID research, March, April this time, they looked into T cells and they looked into myeloid cells to look into, to understand the uh, you know, cytokines. And these data suggested that if you look into the specific subset of CD4 T cells, they found out that there is a substantial increase statistically significant substantial increase in the percentage of interferon gamma positive GMCSA positive CD4 T cells. These are TH1 cells and at times people call them pathogenic TH1 cells. So this indicate that there are these pathogenic TH1 cells which might be contributing to this cytokine storm that we see in severe patients. Remember that though, this paper, they didn't look into 
antigen specific CD4 T cells. They looked into total TH1 CD4 T cells population to really say this subpopulation of CD4 T cells, there is an increased abundance. And of course, they looked into myeloid cells, particularly they looked into monocytes, CD14, CD16 positive monocyte cells. And the data was again very clear that there is an increase percentage of IL-6 positive CD14 monocytes. So there is an increased population of CD14, CD16 monocytes. That was clear. In red bar is the serious severe patients. Blue bar is moderately ill patients. You have an increase in CD14, CD16 monocytes in severe patients. And you see an increase in IL-6 positive CD14 monocytes in severe patients. So this also indicated that there could be an engagement of IL-6 positive inflammatory monocytes in serious, uh, in, in severe COVID. And of course, then uh, the rest is, uh, uh, you know, the way we do research here, we come up with a review article and try to say things that has not been uh, yet documented. And that's what a review article does. I mean, you have a lot of uh, contradictions, but you could have a review article. What this review article says, it kind of gives a conceptual framework that you have virus infection. Remember I said that the interferon response looks like that COVID-2, uh, SARS-CoV-2 shows a skewed transcriptional response. So maybe there is a delay in the interferon response, but these epithelial cells produces cytokines nonetheless that recruits these T cells, CD4 T cells. Those CD4 T cells are going to be GMCSF, uh, interferon gamma positive, GMCSF positive. They make a lot of GMCSF, they make a lot of interferon gamma. And then you have these monocytes that are, you know, coming through bloods and then they being recruited. And locally, this inflammatory milieu allows these monocytes to uh, differentiate into inflammatory macrophages, thanks to interferon gamma, thanks to TNF that are produced by activated T cells. And particularly, GMCSF also promotes their uh, proliferation. Eventually, these monocytes are now making a lot of IL-6, TNF, and other cytokines. So this is an assisted by CD4 T cells, local inflammatory monocytes and macrophages that are promoting this kind of cytokine storm. So that's the model that you have severe patients. They are uh, they are having a, a overt abundance of pathogenic TH1 cells that are communicating that are generating an inflammatory milieu so as to promote inflammatory monocytes and macrophages and that then are making a lot of cytokines and this will eventually lead to a systemic cytokine storm and your organs going to really stop function because of uh, sort of sepsis-like uh, features. And then single cell studies came in and this is again the drawback of this work is only seven patients and six healthy controls and around 3,000 single cells. But quickly look into this important features of the study. They did not, with, when you have a lot of cytokines, you expect this will mobilize neutrophils. And in, again, this is non-vent. That means they are moderately ill patients. ARDS means serious, uh, severe COVID patients. You see uh, not much change in the neutrophils, although we will expect because there is a lot of cytokines in this. What you do see is a sort of intermediate neutrophil that has been mobilized in serious patients quite a bit more. At least that's the single cell study suggests that not exactly the mature neutrophils, but some intermediate form of neutrophils that are a very uh, highly mobilized uh, from bone marrow and is associated with disease severity. CD14 monocytes, the numbers were not different, but they did not in this paper uh, CD4 T cells, the numbers were not different, but they did not look into GMCs a positive interferon gamma positive uh, CD4 T cells. Uh, CD4 T monocytes numbers were not different. Again, they did look into uh, the, here. We are not talking about IL-6 positive CD4 T monocytes. Again, the simple picture: you have a lot of cytokines that are recruiting neutrophils, but it doesn't seem that there is an overt change in the CD4 T monocyte number. It could be an inflammatory subset of monocytes that have changed. And there is a lymphopenia. T cell numbers are uh, falling down. Regardless of disease severity, both in non-vent and ARDS patients, you have a drastic fall in T cells. And when you look into this single cell analysis, this is a simple, uh, you know, cartoon, simple diagram. This is this uh, T cell uh, zone. This is monocytes. And, and these blue stuffs are healthy and the reds are disease. And when you look into this, you can probably get a sense that 
the monocytes and T cell number might not be changing, but there could be some altered expression of genes in these monocytes and T cells in severe patients as compared to healthy control. And uh, they looked into it. They looked into healthy and COVID patients. This is again not really uh, severity, but healthy and COVID patients. And it was a bit uh, interesting that in this study, they could not show that COVID patients are showing more TNF and IL-6 expression in monocytes. As you know, I was trying to get you in a model that you have pathogenic T cells that are producing GM, CSF and interferon gamma, then monocytes are getting recruited and making a lot of IL-6 and TNF. That's the cytokine storm that is disease severity. But in this paper, they could not show any dem dem demonstrate any difference between healthy and COVID patients. One can criticize the cohort size. Uh, and one can keep asking that there could be other mediators which are making other cells that are making these cytokines. The reason I put it in is really to tell you that that literature has not fully matured enough. But the interference, I started this presentation saying there is a skewed response which do not show overt interference signature. What we see here is that there is indeed some difference between healthy and COVID patients with respect to interferon expression, but there is no link to the disease severity that moderately sick patient and severe COVID patient, they produced interferon with similar extent. And when you go into the lymphopenia, this slide is not so important. Uh, there is lymphopenia though, but when you look into the COVID patients and then ask the question about humoral response, IgM antibody level and IgG antibody level. Were they discernible different? That, you know, serious patients uh, didn't produce enough humoral response and that's why they became severe. Well, it was very interesting to notice that, you know, you can see these green dots are mild cases and these browns are severe. And the left side you see IgM titer and left side you see IgG titer. Absolutely no difference. If anything, you can see that severe patients are producing more antibodies than the, than the mild cases. So, uh, so definitely one thing one can conclude that you do not have a deficit in numeral response. One can keep in speculate. I will I like to, you know, there's a lot of uh, audience. I mean, one can provoke this conversation that maybe this high rate of antibody may have a connection to complement activation or antigen dependent enhancement of infectivity. Uh, those has not been demonstrated. Those has not been proved. But one thing that is definitive at this point that you do not have a deficit in human response. You do have a lot of inflammation. The nature of inflammation remains a bit unclear, but there is no deficit in human response. One can then say, well, the severe patients are a lot of virus, right? And that is the problem. That's why they are so severe, showing severe disease symptoms. And this is what the, this is what the, this piece of data, and where I'm going to really get to my final leg of the conversation. What you see here is severe and mild diseases, 10 severe patients and 13 mild cases. And saliva samples were obtained from a posterior or fangial uh, saliva. And initial viral load was measured at the onset of symptom. And at the peak of uh, their disease progression, viral loads were also measured. And then they have plotted on the left, this is initial viral load. On the right, this is peak viral load. And you see that in severe, maybe there is an increase, uh, little bit increase uh, in the viral load, uh, both initial or peak. But if you look at these values, there is no statistically significant difference. And you look at the draw, you clearly see that there are a lot many mild cases where the viral loads are even higher than the severe or peak viral loads in the higher than the severe. So now get a couple of quick conclusions. Let's see if we can get a take-home message which is strong enough. One is severe COVID-19 is not caused by enhanced viral replication. Clearly not. We do not see any evidence suggesting that, again, COVID is a disease. I'm talking about severe COVID where patients are dying and I'm saying if this 15%, if we can save them, then we'll not be worrying about this pandemic anymore. And this, that is why I'm narrowly defining COVID as severe COVID. 
and this is not because of enhanced virus replication. So that's why I'm saying, is it really a viral disease or severe COVID? Is it really a viral disease? Second, severe COVID-19 is not associated with humor, impaired humoral responses either. You do see similar IgG, IgM response. If anything, it's better in severe disease. It's not that, that your inability to generate enough antibody that's killing you. What is very clear that severe COVID is linked with exacerbated inflammation. There are some uh, sort of problem in the literature, you know, one cytokine, one cytokine, and we hear, you know, but overall, you have TNA, you have IL-6, you have IL-1 beta, these cytokines levels are very high. And this has been also noted for some other respiratory viruses. When you have a severe respiratory distress, you began to show high cytokine levels. So it's a cytokine storm mediator. Now, one would be very happy if I had had a clue for the audience. Well, they, you see this SARS-CoV-2, they have this particular protein that they express and that is causing a huge mammoth inflammation and you know, people are dying. Unfortunately, even after four, six months of very, very rigorous research worldwide, we, we have no idea about specific attributes underlying inflammation in severe COVID. We still do not know. And initiation of inflammation, it remains partly unclear at this point. Uh, we do see engagement of CD4 T cells. There are CD4 cytotoxic T lymphocytes. There are CD3, CD8 cytotoxic T lymphocytes. We do see engagement of inflammatory monocytes. But there is some unclarity that exactly sequence of events that is leading to this culminating into a unabated inflammation in severe COVID. That remains a bit unclear. But what remains clear is that you have a cytokine storm going on. We have been in my laboratory, we are interested in uh, inflammation and you know, NFK fabi path, as you, some of you know, that this is important uh, transcription factor for activating expression of uh, dozens of inflammatory cytokines. We have been, uh, we have just started some very preliminary work on this to really understand the mechanism that can lead to uh, unabated inflammatory cytokine expression in respect to severe COVID. But so far, we do not have any virus specific attributes. It's an inflammation in general. We do not have evidence suggesting this is uh, caused by enhanced virus replication. So that's why I'm saying maybe this is severe COVID. If I narrowly define COVID as severe COVID, which is causing people, severe COVID is not because of high virus replication, but because of unabated inflammation. So it's maybe an inflammatory ailment. Now, when you say, okay, well, I redefine the disease, and I redefine the cause of the disease, or, or I can see from the literature that this is, is actually an inflammatory ailment, you have to really rethink about the cure. One cure is targeting the virus, you know, what people have been trying. I have been, uh, I mean, you know, quickly I'll uh, go through this, uh, you know, uh, when you target the virus, your structure is drug designing, you know, a bunch of molecules has been already structured, has been solved. You can see uh, structure is protein, RBD, and then and the nuclear capsid protein, there are a bunch of drugs available. You can repurpose them, particularly that can target RNA polymerase. But I have a quick comment to make, though. Isn't that I was trying to persuade all of you that severe COVID-19 is not caused by enhanced virus replication, and most of 85% of the people, regardless of the virus infection, they are getting uh, getting well on their own. And second, that comment I will send though is on SARS coronavirus that uh, SARS uh, epidemic that has happened close to 15 years ago. We tried with the antiviral uh, repurposing and we still are waiting for a drug that can be repurposed and targeting uh, SARS coronavirus. So what I'm trying to say here is that antiviral is an important uh, uh, tool in our fight against COVID. The, we had uh, little uh, uh, success earlier. We hope this will work, but Again, remember, virus replication is disconnected from severe COVID. Second is you boost the immune system with vaccine. I will quickly rephrase you have motor RNA, right? I mean, that is a lipid nanoparticle and encapsulated mRNA encoding viral spike protein. So you just don't have to really rethink about what antigenic epitope and all this. You just take the mRNA of a virus and put it in lipid and deliver. And given this is a respiratory virus, you will have opportunity to deliver through nasal route. But problem with that is that this platform, uh, that mRNA vaccine platform, this technology is yet untested. I'm not going to say that this is not going to work, but I'm saying that this is untested. Sinovac came up with a 
inactivated SARS coronavirus uh, modality, where you're chemically inactivating SARS coronavirus. Remember, that's how we have worked in smallpox initially, right? There's first a few vaccines that are coming up. One, have to remember that to really administer it to billion of people all across the globe, to generate that much of virus first and then inactivate them, you were talking about potential health hazards. And then that adenovirus vaccine that Oxford is talking about, it's a recombinant adenovirus that is going to express COVID virus, uh, COVID uh, spike protein, thereby you can have oxygen. General concern vaccine is this really thing to go, right? You have vaccinated people, then you can probably, you know, uh, squeeze the virus out of human population. But a timeline for vaccine development is a great concern. It, it, you know, we have been forced to be too optimistic and then people have given up time up in six weeks, six months, but uh, we are still waiting for an HIV vaccine, isn't it? And uh, second is also uncertainty related to long-term protective immunity. We do not know at this point. Nobody, no scientist can claim that a vaccine, even if it develops, even if produces good antibody type, it will generate long-term protective immunity. Uh, it, it may or it may not. And uh, the questions are surfacing that the antibodies are not that stable. It should stay quite some time, but around two to four months, uh, there are people coming up. That's now, you know, antibody titer starts falling down after that. There will be memory cells left though. But we do not know, we cannot comment on long-term protective immunity. And then you have the final one that I'm talking about today, that we, we're trying to fight the virus. We're trying to fight the transmission of the virus by vaccine. And then we are talking about 10 to 15% of the people who are showing severe symptoms. That is clearly because of inflammation. How about fighting inflammation? How about mitigating inflammation? And, and, and bringing down the mortality rate as much as possible. And people began to, as you can see that dextamethasone, right? The story came up a couple of weeks back. These are corticosteroids. These are generic anti-inflammatory drugs that blocks in of your other pathways and their action so as to suppress cytokine expression. And we can also use, people have been, uh, there are all in trial though, specific cytokine antagonists, such as TNF antagonist and IL-6 antagonist. These target severe COVID, no impact on transmission though. And anti-inflammatory drugs can cause pneumonia at times. Actually, you have to understand what I just said in the initial slides. You have inflammation, you have interferon response, they are together going to really restrain viral replication. And then you have to have this anti-inflammatory pathway, particularly regulatory T cells that will be produced by dendritic cells during this early phase of infection. They will produce IL-10 and anti-inflammatory cytokine that in a dynamically controlled manner will suppress inflammation. But if you suppress inflammation too early or if you suppress inflammation too much, you will be, uh, then, uh, you know, you'll be, you, this will pose a health, health risk because uh, it will make you vulnerable to other infections including virus infections, including COVID infections. So uh, its modalities are unclear, but it looks to me that this could be an interesting way to go forward when it comes to uh, address severe COVID, when it comes to address mitigating inflammation. So thereby I finish this talk by saying that anti-inflammatory therapy could be something of immediate importance. Uh, if you have to really uh, bring down the mortality rate, if you have to narrow down your focus on severe COVID, and uh, again, I really appreciate uh, your patience and uh, to hear from uh, me. Thank you uh, for all this and uh, thank you Corona Care uh, group and uh, uh, all this help that, uh, and all this, you know, putting this together again. Uh, we are working on inflammation again. Uh, we, uh, there are a lot of obstacles to directly work on COVID virus, but uh, one might uh, keep thinking about uh, signaling pathways, inflammatory pathways and inflammatory cells and inflammatory immune reactions and try to sort of see how far they can go closer to a COVID scenario and understand why a subpopulation of human would generate such a huge reaction. Remember, that is something that we do not know. Even an RSV, even influenza virus, we knew always that there is a smaller population would generate an overt inflammation to those viruses. Now with COVID, we have a substantially significant 10% population that are generating this huge reaction. We still do not know. Even for COVID, the mechanism of inflammation, initial inflammation remains unclear, but it remains quite clear that inflammation is related to severe COVID and could be therapeutically targeted. Thank you again.
I will stop and take questions from you. Thank you so much, sir. It was really wonderful session. And uh, so um, for uh, the question answer session, I would like to invite uh, uh, Priyanka Lahari. Priyanka? Yeah. Priyanka. Uh, hi, Dr. Vashak. It was really a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. So I'll get on to the questions. Um, so there is a... Uh, so there's a question from Deepak. He's asking, is it possible that severe cases are not provoking proper immune response, making it a tonic-like consequence because of a short, really short time of 15 days? Yeah, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, this is an interesting question. Yeah, can you repeat it, please? Is it, is it possible that severe cases are not provoking proper immune response, making it a chronic-like consequence in a really short time? It's an interesting question. Uh, this is an interesting proposition. Uh, as I have demonstrated, I mean, people have demonstrated severe cases, humoral response is absolutely same. Uh, if anything, severe cases are showing better humoral response and that would have not been possible to achieve if you do not have initial engagement of innate immunity. Second, severe cases are accompanied by huge amount of inflammatory cytokines. That indicates that if anything, that immune system is overtly reacting in severe cases. It's not uh, clear that, uh, I'm not going to really uh, say that in severe cases, there is an immune uh, uh, compromisation. I would say that the severe cases are accompanied by huge immune reactions. Question is, why are they in a subpopulation, uh, in a subtraction of people, why are, is it happening that you have a huge immune reaction? That part is not clear. I, I do not have, I do not know. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Bashak, for the clarification. So next question is by Vishal. He's asking, so is it herd immunity, what we are talking about nowadays, is going to be helpful as human response is seen between severe and the mild COVID patients? So... Yeah, that's a good question. Again, uh, when I say humoral response is similar between severe and mild cases, I do not necessarily mean that vaccines are going to work or heart immunity is not going to work. I'm saying that despite similar humoral response, what inflammation is causing pathology? Because, you know, this inflammation is associated with all these inflammatory cell neutrophils, they damage tissues. Heart immunity Eventually, what is herd immunity? You have a substantial fraction of your population. You know, it's basically break the chain, right? I mean, break the transmission chain. Uh, if you have substantial fraction of your population infected and they do have immunity to the virus, then virus transmission is not going to happen because people you are meeting all around you, many of them will be immune, so your virus is not going to get a passage into the rest of the population. So it's uh, almost, uh, you know, vaccination in a natural course of disease. But we do not know a couple of things about herd immunity. As I said, when I discussed if vaccine is going to work, we do not know if protective immunity, a long-term protective immunity exists for COVID-19. We can speculate that it would, but it would be unfair uh, to assume that this is necessarily true. If it is that there is a long-term protective immunity in COVID-19, then herd immunity would be one way to go forward. It. I will remind you about certain numbers. It is assumed that around 60% of the people, if I could be a bit wrong, I mean, slightly off, but around 60% of the human population has to be infected to get to the herd immunity. So now in our country, are you talking about 100 crores people that need to, be, we need to have an infection? And then are you talking about 10% of them will really be severely ill? That means 10 crores of people are going to be severely ill. And 5% are going to really die. Well, that's, this is a very scary number, right? I'm not going to really, I think, I don't think that hard immunity would be only one way to go forward and hoping things will be better on its own. But I think that the case fatality rate, which is attributed by overt inflammation, one needs to target inflammation and bring down the case fatality rate so or severe disease severity rate so that we can handle the pandemic situation from a health perspective. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, in continuation with that, I have a question that uh, uh, 
why then uh, the people with secondary uh, conditions, uh, those diabetes, is because of the weak immune system, you uh, say, is getting much more affected or much more prone to the disease? And what do you think can be the best bet for them to fight the virus? Uh, the first one is uh, that comorbidity, right? That's something I sort of had a slide but didn't need to really go into it. But comorbidity, there's hypertension, diabetes, right? And uh, and it, people have been speculating, right? With hypertension, with uh, diabetes, people have been making a lot of speculation. As and for me, I think. I will go back to my inflammation biology and try to try to address it that when you have a systemic inflammation, when you have a systemic inflammation, when you have a reduced oxygen saturation in the blood because your lung epithelial began to malfunction because of local tissue damage. And then you go forward to multi-organ failures. And this is when your kidney, if it is already in a compromised state, the likelihood of it to fail is going to be much higher. So this is a very broad sort of way to address this question. Now, what will they do? Uh, this is, at, again, you know, severe patients, uh, they, again, this is, what would they do? There is no diabetes specific intervention that I can probably talk about today. But in general, people with uh, old age and other comorbidities, they have to take precautions as uh, suggested uh, by different governments. One include, of course, the use of mask and uh, social distancing to stay away from the virus. As long as we have a sort of better cure, like vaccine or you know, better anti-inflammatory regimen that can have lesser side effect but still cure people who are in severe ailment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so there is a, a comment, a, a commentary required on one topic. Uh, a question by Pip Banerjee. He asked. Uh, he's interested to know why the kinetics of uh, immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin M are overlapping in severe and mild COVID patients. And why, because one should expect the IgM to go up initially and it would go down pretty quickly and then IgG would go up subsequently. So your comments on that? Yes, uh, this is, uh, I do not know. I may be, <laughs> I think what you have done uh, uh, that you may have uh, focused too much on the line that was drawn, right? Uh, the line, you are focusing on the line. I mean, I showed you a scattered plot. And if you look into the scattered plot, I mean, you can draw any kind of line. Uh, but if you look into those uh, scattered plot, those dots, you will see that, uh, you know, IgM, I mean, and, and when you are saying uh, IgM should go first and then come down and then IgG will come up. But the data is coming from a human population. If you pair it, for a given human, you are pairing its IgM and IgG and try to see what the curves look like. Uh, that would be a way to go forward. This has not been done in that curve, right? And uh, and in a human population, that's one problem with human immunology. Not a problem. I mean, we have to find out a way to address things better. But it's a cohort and people have deviations uh, in response to IgM, response, in response to going down this IgM. It's not an animal cohort that you do in animal studies. But again, I'm trying to say that if I had one particular patient in a time course, I follow its IgM and IgG level, I am going to be pretty sure that I will see an early IgM increase and then followed by a subsequent increase in IgG. But how long will it take for IgM to go down? That's speculative and that can vary subtly uh, in uh, depending on the antigen and depending on the individual. All right? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, there is one question by Siddhi Gupta. She is asking, uh, as you are saying in severe and mild COVID patients, you have the same humoral response. Then what are the those fate of those antibodies in the severe COVID patients? So, are they being yeah. useful? Yeah, yeah. No, those severe, <laughs> severe patients who are actually uh, somehow recovering, not succumbing to death or mortality. And those convalescence plasma has been you know, it's been going to be useful, right? Because it's going to be full of antibodies and this has been used in Delhi and uh, and Calcutta. I mean, one of my colleagues, immunologist, uh, Dr. Dikuman Ganguly is uh, spearheading an effort to do convalescent plasma therapy in Calcutta, in West Bengal. Uh, we are doing it in many states, including Kerala, in many parts of India. But 
the question is that these antibodies are going to be useful. There's no question about it. All moderate and moderately ill patients, their antibodies, their plasma is going to be useful. But the take home message is that it's not true that, that in severe patient you had a very little if any antibody response. Then my life would be easy that you know you have some virus which somehow suppresses immoral immunity and we succ we are, uh, we are succumbing to it. Uh, and you know it's accompanied by severe diseases, accompanied by huge virus growth. None of these are happening. You do not see a weakened humoral response. You do not see a, a spiraling uh, viral titer in severe patients. Only you see inflammation and the cause of which is unclear. Okay. Yeah. So connected to that is uh, Sumana who is asking the what do you think is the best immunomodulator for this treatment? Um, and to that, I, I will add one question is, uh, so recently Merck also has started clinical trials on TLR uh, inhibitors against TLRs. So what do you think, whether they are going to be the good option to target the inflammatory or the cytokine storm inside these patients? Uh, see, immune modulators, uh, there are two categories and one is that anti-inflammatory. That's what I actually try to focus. And sometimes it is a bit, uh, uh, we need to be careful about uh, commenting on things that I do not fully know. Uh, but immune modulators, anti-inflammatories are going to be useful to suppress inflammation. But I already have expressed, explained the caveat that inflammation, if regulated, is good for us. It's only harmful when it is unchecked and that is exactly what is happening in severe patient but then you get anti-inflammatory if you suppress inflammation too much it has been shown in influenza virus if you try to do too much with corticosteroids you get pneumonia viral and bacterial pneumonia and uh, this is not good so this is going to be a quite a bit of some trial and error method i can see that dextamethasone has given some promising result and i want to see more of it other antagonists that you just mentioned, TLR antagonists, yes, I mean, as you can see that there would be uh, TLR ligands and they will get engaged in viral disease and their chronic activation, their, uh, you know, persistent activation can promote inflammation. You can try to block them. This will be a way to go forward. If that I can say from, I do basic immunology from that perspective, I can say these are, this makes sense, but will it work in a complex disease environment? and in a complex human setting. Uh, one only can ascertain by trial and error. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Vijay, I think we are done here for the question answer session. Okay. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Basak, for your uh, time and uh, efforts that you have given today. It was such a wonderful and very informative talk. So I would like to take this opportunity to tell everyone to please visit our website that is coronacures.co and uh, the cypreneur.com for your kind of information. Cypreneur is, a, uh, is a, an init initiative for connecting the science to the entrepreneurship where you can get more opportunities and uh, guidance to uh, tra translate your science into a more useful application. And uh, try to use the uh, uh, use the full possible all possible resources that we have on the, our websites and uh, our team who's like giving a really good effort, so much effort. We are trying to bring more uh, things on the website and uh, try to make full use of it. So, if you have any other question, please email us. So, we are sorry for other people; those uh, we could not take their questions because of the time limit and. Uh, and please email us at team corona cures at the rate of gmail.com. And today's webinar, uh, its recording would be available and will be posted in our YouTube channel as well as on our websites. And uh, please uh, be ready for the next webinar with Dr. Devo Jyoti Chakravarti from uh, IGIV New Delhi on 4th July. That means the next weekend. And uh, finally, thank you, uh, Dr. Basak. Thank you. Thank team. you very much. Thank you for putting it together. I'll uh, look forward to uh, uh, get engaged with you guys more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Bye.